Today's agenda, though, we're going to cover everything about um, critical thinking. Um, I just wanted to bring you some information on what critical thinking is and some strategies to use in your classroom. As we go through, as you know, I usually love to, to do definitions so that we're all on the same page and that as we look at these definitions, and there's two of them that I want to bring you in particular today, um, but to think about those and how you can use these in your classroom. And the first one is um, just thinking about critical thinking and the learners that you have. Um, this is a broad definition and it starts with our ability to think reasonably. And that means that we don't have the bias thrown in there. We don't have emotions or being very subjective in our opinions. Um, critical thinking pulls that out and it does go way beyond memorizing. Our students need to start thinking for themselves. What we need to see is that when we question meanings and significance of claims and arguments, um, and, and we don't take things on face value, that we're able to solve problems in a very productive way. And then when we are reading different texts, we know how to break things down in a text in order to better understand it. And that just improves our entire ability to comprehend. So throughout, uh, through all of the subjects, uh, reading and thinking, uh, critical thinking is important for our learners. Now, there are probably as many um, definitions out there about critical thinking as there are people on this webinar. Uh, but I want you to look at this one, and I think this has a great way of breaking down the definition in what we want our learners to be able to do. So. Think about this as a definition. We take information, we interpret it um, in, into our own words, and that makes it our own. By doing that, we can see how it is uh, applicable to our lives, how it applies to our lives, and literally how it guides our belief and our actions. So critical thinking is rational. It's logical, it's objective. And when we take any piece of information, we need to really understand it, to read uh, between the lines and actually beyond the lines. And when we do that, we can see that it is evidence-based. We see that in the real world, um, that it's grounded in the best available evidence that we have uh, available. It is systematic, it has clear steps and there is an order to it. It's a reflexive process, and it's so very important to let our learners have that reflexive time after each lesson uh, when we give them the time to process what they've just learned so that each lesson can be reinforced by discussing, discussing uh, what they've just learned and giving them time to think about how it applies to their lives and how they can use it and what prior learning, and we're going to talk a little bit more about prior learning because it is so important, and how it connects with um, everything that we're going to be doing um, in the classroom. I did want to offer this to you. It is um, a very comprehensive document. Um, I think it's just 20 or 30 pages, but it does have, and it's Dr. Richard Paul and Linda Elder, uh, put together a lot of work on this topic of critical thinking and how, how it's important to the teaching process. It even um, has uh, a whole list of, of standards that they have developed. It tells us that critical thinking is the foundation of a strong education. So it is so important. I've put the website up there so that you could um, take a screenshot or um, do it, just Google critical thinking competency standards and it's going to come up. But I do think that it is the foundation um, that we need to provide for our learners because without it, 
they're probably never going to have the advantage of, of being taught how to critically think because we are not born with it. Um, so let's look at how we can align it. You know, you have an idea now about what critical thinking is. So now let's look at how we can incorporate it into some lessons. And we're going to take a look at some really specific strategies in just a few minutes. But right now, I want to talk about the steps, um, the process to get started um, when you're going to start teaching those critical thinking skills. The first one is I want you to think about tying it to your learning uh, objectives, and, and this is the best place to start. It's the most obvious place to embed those critical thinking skills um, in with your student learning objectives. And so we start with organizing our lessons um, by writing out those learning outcomes that we all have done. And you know those contain a verb, that action word, and the object, which is a noun. And we often start out with things like, Students will, or by the end of the lesson, students will be able to, and just remember, uh, Bloom's taxonomy is a starting point if you are kind of fuzzy on that. Um, and it has a list of appropriate words that, where you can really clearly state um, what you want your learners to do by the time that lesson uh, has completed. Um, and at what level? And it has a lot of different ways that you can tie those learning objectives and embed those critical thinkings in there. So then you would take, uh, and I think it's the most effective way, um, is to get these critical thinkings into your learning objectives. Um, and I think that is through explicit instruction. You know, most of us will remember um, this teaching strategy from our education classes when we were going through our teaching program in college. And if not, look up just explicit instruction strategy online. But the main points would be to use content scaffolding, use modeling, and then provide support um, while teaching the content of whatever topic you're going to be embedding this critical thinking in with your learning objectives. And then the assessment. Think about how you're going to um, decide um, if you have achieved the goals um, and seen the pros, uh, progress toward those learning outcomes. What are you going to assess in order to determine um, if the students have learned and demonstrated progress toward those learning outcomes? Um, so that's the best way. Let, let's look at an example of that. And I have um, just uh, put forth now in, and you can all see it's Bloom's taxonomy, um, but I wanted to give you exact an example of matching those learning objectives within that hierarchy. Um, so you see the, let me pinpoint it for you. Here with Bloom's, we see the lower order thinking skills, and this is what we do so much of the time in the classroom, is just simply asking our learners to recall, to remember things. Then we can go up one more step and just see if they are grasping the meaning of what we're teaching and that they have a basic understanding. And then as we go on up, it's applying or using that information um, in a new and sometimes similar situation. But then when we get on up into the higher order thinking skills, we look at things like analyzing. Um, taking the things that are known and identifying the relationships between the things, between and among sometimes. We do an evaluation and we examine the information so that we can make valid judgments about things. Also using information to create something new and creation um, is the top higher order thinking skill that is um, on our chart today. So let me, put an example up there. If we are going to do a lower order thinking skill, uh, just think about this as an example. Students will evaluate or students will define um, the principal components of the water cycle. And you see there that it's just um, that lower order thinking skill that you're just asking them to recall what the de definition is. But if we want to bump that up to a higher order thinking skill, think about challenging your students with the word will evaluate. So students will evaluate 
how increased or decreased global temperatures will affect um, the um, components of the water cycle. So you see both of the examples are about water cycle and both require that foundational knowledge um, that forms the facts uh, of what makes up the water cycle. But look at how the higher order objective goes beyond just that factual, um, actual understanding. Um, into the application and evaluation uh, process. So that would be an example of how you could really bump that up and get it up to a higher order thinking skill so that you're gonna be challenging your learners to look at more um, of a challenging way to start evaluating and analyzing. So critical thinking um, does require domain knowledge. Um, it's gonna be really hard um, to, to learn anything, a uh, real challenge, if you don't know something about what you're gonna be teaching or what they're gonna be learning. So first is the content knowledge, and that's one of the key factors in understanding how to approach um, critical thinking skills and teaching that. So you can't think critically about topics that you know little about, or you can't problem solve if you don't know well enough how to recognize and solve something. You know, research concludes that the best approach is to explicitly teach, and that's what I was talking about before. And an example of that is, let's say you're gonna be teaching a history lesson. Uh, students need to interpret documents in the context of the sources. Um, so that they can find corroboration and um, just put the historical text into con context. For example, if you're going to be teaching a lesson on the Constitution, learners need to know not just how the language was written um, in that different way that they spoke, but how they write. And to put that into historical context, what was happening that caused us to need a constitution. So that kind of analysis isn't uh, relevant in science, um, but where the source of a document uh, is important is when you're looking at maybe the scientific method or the history. So those are some really important things to consider. Then as we think about prior knowledge, uh, we know that we need to gain that information for critical thinking to happen. Um, as humans, we really do not store information verbatim. We're, we don't just copy things and it goes into our mind. Um, we experience those as memories. But what we actually do is to integrate that new information um, from learning into what we already know, into that pre-existing knowledge about uh, the world um, as we've learned it in the past. So prior knowledge means knowledge that we have previously learned in the classroom, and we have an advantage in adult ed because our students have gone through K-12 and they have some information that they bring into the classroom. So just think about because this building of new information with prior knowledge is so necessary, we're going to have to really figure out ways that we can uh, do some creative things so that this information can be efficiently encoded from our working memory and hopefully and with practice into our long term memory. And um, I want to start into the workforce so that you'll see that this skill is not just something we're teaching so that they can understand it for the test, whichever they're taking. But it's also going to be a skill that's going to be important to them as they move into the workforce. Um, you can see on the uh, screen that by 2025, critical thinking will be one of the most important and sought after workplace skills along with, and you see the others, uh, analytical thinking, creativity, 65%. Um, and flexibility and look at digital literacy, 212% increase by 2025. And I will stop and take a breath right there and see if we have any questions. Nope. Okay, well, I'll go on. Um, we're going to stay with workforce just for a minute. And I just wanted to give you some ideas about what critical thinking is from the definition that we looked at earlier. 
uh, but how important these skills are for their success in the workforce, not just in our classes, like I said, but what's going to be important when they get out into the world of work. So we're going to see that problem solving. Think about how important an employer is going to value uh, an employee who can problem solve, that can interpret, can summarize, that can also infer. And that is a big, big um, uh, challenging sometimes critical thinking skill on the GED or the high set. They will see that. So inference is a, a, a good one to start teaching in the classroom. But also categorizing, organizing, also analyzing, predicting, and evaluating. So, you know, we just need to look at the verbs um, that identify these critical thinking skills and to see how important they are, not only in our, our um, classroom instruction, but in the workforce. So now let's take a look at some strategies. One of them is predicting. Now, we may not think that predicting is such a hard thing to do. But for our learners, it is. Um, it has to be taught. And for them to understand that in predicting, as you and I may think of it as pretty intuitive, it's not a skill that our learners are maybe very good at. Um, but it is an important skill for reading and for testing. Um, and there's two things they need to do. They need to look at the clues to the author leaves for reading, such as um, the words in italics, the words in bold. Look at the captions, the pictures. Look at the different text features for the different things they're um, going to be reading. And then they have to have, of course, that schemata. Uh, it is the background knowledge, that mental coding that has already taken place so that they can attach new, new information to it. And one interesting thing is that you would need to start easy with your learners in prediction, um, because every time we predict and we get something correct, that releases endorphins in our in our brains, and that makes us feel good. It's that good feeling um, that we get when we do something right. So kids, start with something easy. Let your students be um, affected by those endorphins so that they will feel good and want to, to answer more questions and take um, some risk. The other is inference. And as you can see on the screen, we're going to have to look at textual clues again. And then background knowledge, and this is just about um, an em employee who looked down at broken pieces of glass. I started crying. How can I explain this to my boss? Well, the background knowledge is that there are some key words. Um, we know it's a worker because of the word boss. We know that they're upset because of the word crying. It can be as simple as this to explain inference to your learners. Start out easy and then build it. This is another way. Look at cartoons. It is so much fun to do different things to get your learners' attentions. Look at the different ways that this um, cartoon talks about things that um, are important to us as teachers, um, the study habits, but what all you could do with just that one visual. Um, you could talk about observations. Um, what is the situation? What comes to mind? I've thrown up some questions up there, but I know you could build some other questions. Talk about the prior knowledge. Um, what can you infer from this picture? What conclusions? So here you're building these critical thinking skills and always give your learners time to, to reflect. I think a lot of times we just don't stop at the end of a lesson and we let our students kind of process all the information that we've get, given them. So taking the time to reflect on what they've just learned, how it connects with what they already know and what the application is. Um, and that's gonna give them a deeper understanding and they're gonna retain it longer. So from that deeper understanding, think about what they have learned, how they learned it and why it's important. If it, re, if it promotes metacognition, then they're gonna know how to self-monitor, to regulate, to find things, know how to go find things that they don't know. Um, so that's part of uh, self-monitoring and regulating, knowing that they don't know and how to go find it. 
Um, this encourages through questioning and analyzing the critical thinking. And we look at the application of the skills, which is so important, not just to teach the skill, but look at that transfer of learning through the application of the skill. And then as an ongoing process, we want them to have this continuous learning that goes on as we promote critical thinking. These, if you want to take a screenshot of this, feel free to. This is just uh, an idea to do a one minute paper about any of these thoughts that I've put down up here. The first one, without looking at their notes, uh, what was the most memorable or what stands out about today's class? You could ask them what was the most surprising or the most unexpected idea uh, that you discussed today? Um, what was the interesting questions that you still have about the topic? What was the most useful thing that was discussed? So you see, these are things just to throw out there, have them write a one minute paper to get the, the process of thinking started. I do want to take just a second for web step of knowledge and, you know, I think a lot of times we look at web and we think, okay, this is DOK, uh, we know it's in high set, we know it's in a GD, but it's just um, uh, the, the levels of difficulty. Well, that's really not what it is. Web step of knowledge actually it categorizes the text according, according to the complexity of thinking. I've put two websites up there that will give you um, the resources for each one if you wanted to go to um, the high set uh, test at a glance that tag document or go into the um, assessment guide for instructors for the GED. And we want to build this out. Uh, we want to do level one, of course, remembering facts, doing recall. We also want to go into level two, that second depth of knowledge, um, so that that application starts, knowledge, the application of knowledge. And here our learners will need to know how to correctly solve problems, to, to make um, decisions, to complete multi-step equations, you know, all those things when we get up into level two. Level three is strategic knowledge. And for there, we are really are getting into the complex thinking, the critical thinking where we have to analyze and uh, do more complex. Now, we know that level four, there's not any on the test because that's more lengthy longitudinal data that's required um, for level four. But I want to challenge you and just say um, for one week, keep a log of how many times you just give your learners uh, a level one question or level one um, instruction. Challenge yourself um, to go into level two and level three um, so that you can start building um, all the critical thinking skills that they're gonna need. Here's some ways to do it through active um, learning. And I just, I'm really big on active teaching and these are some ways to do role plays, to ca do case studies. Group projects, it is so great to get them into groups of four to five and let them share information. Uh, think about the communication skills that builds, um, how to get along with others. These are some workforce skills too. There's a whole list up there of act, active, active teaching techniques that I hope you will try. There are some resources also. Timelines are great, especially for history. You could look at cause and effect organizers. You could do the rubrics. Um, give them the rubrics that they're going to be judged over um, for the essay. Do a KWL chart. And a Venn diagram is always helpful um, as a visual aid for critical thinking. Now, Active learning through questioning is one of the most important things that we can do. And I want to just tell you that uh, the research is showing that we use those lower order questions, you know, just the simple recall, 85 to 90 percent of the time in most classes. We want to get away from that. As you think about Webb's depth of knowledge, think about level two and level three. So that what we do for level two in that um, application and then into this um, strategic thinking, we look at those higher order questionings. Um, so we're going to move 
from 85 to 90 percent on the lower to that in the higher order questioning. Do not give them yes or no questions because I promise you, you will get a yes or no answer. So open ended questions are your best so that it encourages discussion. And then you can always start with that what um, to get the conversation go rolling. But then go into, well, why do you think that happened? Or how do you think this would have um, this would have reacted in a different situation? Get them to start analyzing and evaluating information instead of just simple recall. Um, Socratic, uh, Socratic questioning, sorry about that. Um, it's best known a uh, way of teaching critical thinking skills because Socrates was best known to Plato and all of his students to encourage thinking through questioning. So it uh, does require that logical inquiry and reasoning. And what we, just to give you some examples of the kinds of questions that um, are used when we're looking at Socratic um, questioning, the clarification questions. Why is this question important? How does it apply to everyday life? And then the implications and consequences. <clears throat> what generalizations can you make? How does this tie into what we've learned before? Look at the viewpoint or perspective questions. Um, what's another way to look at this? Or what are the strengths and weaknesses? Some others, um, maybe just questioning the question. I love that one. Well, what do you mean by if the student has asked you a question or has given you a statement? Um, the assumption, um, what could we assume instead of that answer or probing, which is uh, probing questions are really great because um, that gets them to tie into that, that prior information. Tips for using the Socratic questioning is to plan. That is the key word here, because if you don't plan, you're not going to be able to build significant questions that have meaning and direction. Draw as many students into the discussion as possible. Don't rescue them. If you've asked them a question, allow at least 30 seconds uh, for them to um, acknowledge the, the question and, and come up with an answer. Um, it doesn't have to be any longer than that, but just give them a chance to come up with the answer themselves. The other thing is to follow up on their responses and then periodically do some writing with them, key points that will summarize what you've discussed. This is a critical thinking scoring rubric. Look at that. Um, all the things on the left, the partic participation, the contributions, listening, Follow up questions, point of view, and critical thinking are all built into this scoring rubric. And you can see that you've got those characteristics of an emerging person who is critical thinking um, by summarizing, developing, and those that, who have mastered. And these are the different criteria that are used to rate the different responses. So just something fun. Critical thinking scoring rubric will get you that, South of Kansas State. Um, and to, to wrap things up, critical thinking is not an add-on. It really should be an integral part of your lessons. It needs to be deliberate and intentional and talk with your learners about what it entails, what it looks like, and how you're going to use it in the classroom. And to leave you with this thought, Learning to think critically is one of the most significant activities of adult life. I will check one more time for questions. Nope, we're all good. So you will receive a follow-up email. At the bottom left-hand corner in the blue box, you will just click on that My Certificate and you will be given a certificate of attending today's, for attending today's um, webinar. So thank you so much. Um, next week, I'll be back. We're going to be doing communication skills next week. So I really hope all of you come and join us. And I have enjoyed presenting this topic. I love this topic. Um, so thank you so much for coming today. And I hope you'll be with me next week.